Uh, thank you very much. And um, welcome everybody to my talk, Bridging the Data Science Gap in Production Machine Learning with Tempo, GPT-2 at scale. Um, so just as a heads up, you will find the slides in this link at the top right. Um, and you will be able to uh, find the reference to all of the um, open source examples that we're gonna be covering in this session. So a little bit more about myself. So my name is Alejandro Saucedo. Um, I am engineering director at uh, Selden Technologies and chief scientist at the Institute for Ethical AI, as well as a governing member at large at the ACM. So a bit more about uh, Selden. So Selden is a machine learning deployment and monitoring uh, open core company. So we basically have a, one of the most popular uh, open source Kubernetes based machine learning deployment frameworks. And uh, you know, as a company, we offer um, enterprise management of uh, machine learning at scale uh, for serving, monitoring, observability, et cetera. And the Institute is a research center based in the UK focused on the design development and standardization of uh, the responsible use and operation of machine learning systems. So today what we're gonna be doing is delving into a broad range of uh, very interesting topics. So this will include uh, talking a little bit more about the, what we refer to as the data science gap in MLOps or production machine learning. And we're gonna then talk about some ways in which we can address this gap by making it easier for data scientists to productionize models at scale. We're gonna be doing this using this framework called Tempo, as well as Selden Core, Triton, and a couple of other frameworks like Onyx and ML Server. And we're gonna be taking a very practical use case. Um, so it's going to be quite an interesting session. So we're gonna be talking about quite a lot of uh, relevant topics. So to start with, let's talk about some of the challenges that data scientists face when uh, scaling their machine learning uh, capabilities, right? Once they train a model, they want to make it available for business consumption. One of the things that data scientists end up getting stuck is dealing with the complexities of production software, right? And this of course tends to happen uh, more once you start having more than a couple machine learning models in production. Some challenges that uh, make it more complex are things like the specialized hardware that is involved, right? The fact that in some cases for inference, you may require specialized hardware like GPUs or even TPUs, large, number, uh, large, large amount of memory, and then the scaling of those components. There may be some complex uh, dependency graphs for data relationships. There may be some compliance requirements that may become more critical as the production machine learning uh, models are being used in more critical environments. And there's also the, the need for uh, the reproducibility of the models themselves, the code, the data that goes through them for both diagnostic and auditability purposes. And the key thing that we're starting to see as well is that there is a increase in what normally is referred to as MLOps uh, platforms. These are basically end-to-end, -end, uh, uh, you know, large scale or at least larger scale systems that allow data scientists to productionize their models throughout the entire machine learning life cycle. So the data processing, the data labeling, the feature engineering, the training of the models, and then the serving and deployment of the models, the monitoring of the models, uh, the evaluation of the models, et cetera, et cetera. Now, one of the challenges that we see is that even though these MLOps platforms do introduce capabilities to scale models, they do introduce a lot of potential red tape and limitations specifically to the data scientists still creating uh, barriers that uh, limit and in, uh, introduce deeper involvement and kind of uh, suboptimal processes between the data scientists, the machine learning engineers and the DevOps uh, personas. And ultimately the main uh, way to address this is to ensure that when a data scientist is able to create a model, 
they don't have to wait until it's deployed in production such that they have to ask a DevOps person to see why it failed or to fetch the logs or to have to look at the Kubernetes environment because the data scientist would not want to or would not uh, require to actually delve into those level of infrastructure complexities. Now, the proposed way of addressing this is through functionality that would be targeted or tooling that would be targeted for the data scientists to be able to test, evaluate, and extend as much as they can in their training environment, such that when the models are handed over for those latter production environments, those are actually fully tested, they are much more robust, and they are going to be working as the same sort of expectations as they had in their training environments, providing some tooling that makes it all easier. So the way that we're gonna show how to do this, we're gonna be taking the GPT-2 model. And the reason why is because this is a slightly more complex, uh, more advanced state-of-the-art machine learning model. Uh, if you are familiar with GPT-2, what this allows you to do is to provide an input text and the, the model would be able to predict what could be the next token to generate text. And it actually has been used for a lot of very interesting use cases uh, to provide human-like uh, text generation. So examples of this include online text games, adventure games that allow you to create a full-on environment and interact with it in a pretty special and specific way, as well as other potential use cases that allow for automatic generation of text, right? So this is a very interesting machine learning model that requires, that has been trained on, you know, millions of parameters or, or a very significantly large uh, you know, data set that we would um, benefit from being able to like deploy in specialized hardware in scalable environments. So that's why we're taking this use case. How we're gonna do this, we're going to, as mentioned previously, use Tempo to simplify the productionization process for data scientists. We're going to first fetch a pre-trained GPT-2 model using the Hugging Face library. This is going to be a TensorFlow model. We're going to optimize this TensorFlow model by exporting it into the Onyx format. We're going to talk a bit more about that. And then we're going to be leveraging Tempo to allow data scientists to first deploy their model inside of Docker in their local environments without having to deal with any of the complexities of the um, you know, overall you know, machine learning engineering complexities. And then once they're happy with uh, the way that they can interact with the model, they're going to be able to very easily just push it to Kubernetes into a highly scalable environment without having to deal with any of the complexity using this framework called Seldon Core uh, as a Kubernetes backend, but without having to deal with any of the complexities. And this will become a little bit more clear as we delve into the actual hands-on example. As I mentioned, the example and links are on the slides and you can find them over here. So let's get started. Let's first fetch the model and optimize it. As I mentioned, we're gonna be using the Hugging Face library, which is a transformer-based library that has a vast amount of uh, pre-trained models uh, that you can actually leverage. And it is as simple as just importing from the transformers module, the GPT-2 tokenizer and the model. We will see why we need a tokenizer and a model, but this is as simple as just fetching it directly from their library. The reason why we actually need both the tokenizer and the model is because let's take this example. So let's assume that we actually want to provide the model this input of I love artificial intelligence. We would actually store this in a variable. We would then actually use the tokenizer to first convert this text into machine readable tokens that then the model would be able to process. In this case, it would be the bunch of tokens, which are the representation of each of the words which then we would be able to provide to the model to generate our text. So now we would get as the output of the model, the generated text of, I love artificial intelligence, but I'm not sure if it's worth, right? So it's actually generating human-like text by just using the model. Now, one thing that we need to remember is that the model can only generate one token at a time. It actually predicts the next token. So whenever we give the entire text, it predicts one token, then we use the new text 
to predict the next token, right? So here we're saying, I want to generate, you know, maximum of 20 tokens, but this generate function is actually abstracting a lot of the logic. The reason why I'm talking about this now is because once we productionize the model, we're gonna have to actually write ourselves the logic of this generate. So the way that this is actually uh, doing it is using the greedy algorithm. What that means is that whenever you perform a prediction with the GPT-2 model, what you actually get is the probabilities of each of the tokens to be the next token, right? So what we're gonna be doing is just take the next immediate highest probability. Of course, there are other algorithms that can be used like beam search that allows you to actually look at several kind of like steps beyond before you actually take the next token. But you know, this is not a GPT-2 talk. This is a talk about um, bridging the gap in production machine learning, making it easy to, for data scientists to create and orchestrate complex logic without having to deal with infrastructure complexities. So now let's have a look at how we can uh, start optimizing and productionizing this model. The first thing that we're gonna be doing is optimizing it using the Open Neural Network Exchange project. This is a Linux Foundation project that allows um, the exporting of TensorFlow, um, PyTorch, and other type of deep learning models uh, into a format that is not just um, easier uh, to manage, but also it allows for uh, deeper optimizations, right? So it allows for better performance and uh, more sort of nuanced optimizations, right? So we're gonna just be using a simple command to take a TensorFlow model and convert it into that Onyx format. Now, the question is, we're talking about running it locally, right? But so far, I showed you how you can run it on Python. But how can you go from, I can run it in my Jupyter Notebook as a, as, a, as, a, as a model into I have a you know, service that can be consumed for business applications, right? Like, like the game that I was showing you earlier that was able to allow users to actually play a text-based adventure game, right? How can I expose it into that without having to deal with all of the complexity of the infrastructure? And this is where we are going to start leveraging Tempo and we're going to be productionizing the model um, into you know, what would be a optimized NVIDIA server, as well as to run it in local Docker and then productionize it into a scalable environment, right? And this will become a little bit more clear of what that looks like. So what Tempo, allow, what Tempo gives us in order for the data scientists to be able to productionize their model, they, it allows you to actually abstract it into a simple set of steps. The first step is to define the model wrapper, right? So this is basically the uh, specification of what is the framework of your model? What is the path to the local artifact that we exported? That is the Onyx artifact. What is the specific name that you want to give and other perhaps um, you know, configurations that you want to have? So we define the wrapper for the model itself. Then we can run the model in Docker and perform predictions, right? It's very much as simple as that for us to run it in Docker. But then if you remember from what we were talking about, our model only predicts the next token and it uses tokens. So we need something that converts our human readable strings into tokens and then calls our model multiple times, right? This is where we can actually use Tempo to define a custom pipeline. And this is basically custom logic that can be orchestrated, that can, that can be used to orchestrate some specific steps that, could inter, that can interact with a single or multiple models, right, that we have already defined. So we're gonna define our custom pipeline. And similar to the previous one, we can run our pipeline and our model first in Docker, right? So the model is going to run in NVIDIA and the pipeline is gonna run in a Python environment that Tempo provides. And finally, the actual step to deploy it into Kubernetes is as simple as just using one function, given that we've already tested everything, we are happy with everything, and we can just proceed. Now let's actually see what this really looks like. So the first step to define the model wrapper with Tempo, what we have to do is just import the model from the tempo.serve, this allows us to then define what would be the model name, the actual platform, which in this case would be model framework.onyx, 
right? If we didn't convert it to Onyx and we just deploy the TensorFlow or the PyTorch one, we would be able to use model framework.tensorflow or model framework.pytorch, right? So it's as simple as defining uh, one of the many supported frameworks. Then we actually just define where, where is the folder, the local folder where we actually have the Onyx artifact. And then we can actually provide a remote bucket that we can then use for the production use case, right? Because ultimately, in order for that to be a scalable service, it's gonna have to be able to fetch all of those artifacts. But we'll get to that in a bit. Right now, all you need to do is that it's as simple as just defining this wrapper and then as simple as running it into the tempo local runtime. So the way that we do that is we just import deploy local from tempo.serve.deploy. We then run our model that we just defined through that deploy local function. We then get that remote model, which is actually running in Docker using Triton. So we now have a service that is running locally with an exposed REST and gRPC API, which then we can very simply send a request. If you remember, because it's just the model, we need to send the tokens and we're gonna predict the next token. So locally, we have to provide the logic where we would take an input, which is this string. This is a test, right? We would then encode that string into the tokens, right? We would then get those tokens. We would then create the uh, you know, inputs that we want to send to the model. And then we would actually run that through the model using the remote gpt2 model dot predict we would pass that and we would receive the output that output comes back in tokens right if you remember these are all of the tokens and we want to take the one with the highest probability and when we print it we see that the next token is the word of right so right now it's still relatively complex because we deployed a model that predicts the next token the next step is to define the custom logic right if you remember we have to devise the pipeline logic that is going to, 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 to perform that comparison. So this actual um, logic, instead of using the model class, we're going to be using the tempo pipeline class. We have the same sort of like similar configuration, but we now define where we want to store uh, all of the sort of local artifacts, which will include the custom logic as well as this transformer, right? So if you remember, we're gonna be using this transformer uh, tokenizer in order for us to convert that, that incoming string. And the only thing that we need to do for tempo is to define a predict method where whatever you send to the model, it's going to actually be uh, passed through this custom logic. What that actually looks like inside of the predict method is basically what we just did, right? We would actually iterate for the number of tokens that we want to predict. And we would basically just take whatever input we receive. So in the previous example, it would be something like, this is a test. We would actually tokenize that. We would convert it, send it to the model, right? Because here we are actually using that model that we defined uh, within the previous one, the GPT-2 model that we had previously, right? And we're gonna be able to actually use that model dot predict whilst Tempo does all of the com complex logic behind the scenes. Now we have to then convert the output of the model into a string and we need to append it into the initial string. And we just rinse and repeat, right? So what would happen is we would have the input string. This is a test for the first iteration. The first token is gonna to be off, right? So then we would do it again with this is a test off and we would get the next token, the next token, the next token until we're happy. And then we return the final output. The next step is to just run that pipeline and the model in Docker. So it is also as simple as just running deploy local of that pipeline. And we would then just be able to get that similar remote local object that we can call predict. But instead of having to pass the raw tokens, we can now just pass a string. So now we're passing the string, I love artificial intelligence. And then re the response that we get back is I love artificial intelligence, but I'm not sure if it's worth blah, blah, blah. Right? So this is exactly what we saw before, but now we, we have a fully productionized you know, service that is running and tested within our Docker environment that works. Now, this is what we have so far. We have been able to run that custom pipeline logic and that GPT-2 model 
in our local Docker environment, what we now want to do is to actually do the same thing and run that in our Kubernetes environment for the data scientists to not have to deal with any of the complexity, right? Because Temple already handles the complexity of, okay, well, you have already your Kubernetes cluster over there. You know, it would be running all the, all the relevant stuff that your DevOps team may have configured. The only thing that you need to do is to say, I have already finished this configuration of my local uh, service. I've tested it, I'm happy with it. Now it will be working in the same way in that production environment. Now, the, the step to actually deploy it in Kubernetes is the simple step of actually using the deploy remote function instead of the deploy local function, right? Whenever you actually uh, use the one for Docker, the only thing that you have to do is use the deploy local. That's the default for the local environment. It uses Docker. For this one, we just use deploy remote and we pass the pipeline that in itself just uh, you know, interfaces with Kubernetes to do all of the required uh, steps to make sure that it's actually running as the rele relevant Kubernetes deployments, right? So it handles all of the complexity for us. We don't have to deal as data scientists with any of that sort of stuff. And the main thing is that right now I am actually showing you the imperative interface of the production process for Temple, right? But Temple also exposes something that DevOps and platform teams really care about which is declarative interfaces. So you can actually also leverage the declarative interface of Tempo, which is a little bit outside of the scope of this talk, but you can check in some of the examples that I've linked in the previous uh, uh, area. So the, the key thing here is that once we actually run deploy remote, what we actually get is a similar object that allows us to interact with our remote model that is deployed in Kubernetes. And we can similarly send that input request of I love artificial intelligence. And you would actually have that same interaction between the pipeline and the model as separate services that you can actually just interact with. And similar to how we're interacting with the pipeline, you can also interact with the model directly. And this is the, the beauty of uh, you know, the framework uh, Tempo that it abstracts all of the, uh, all of the complexity that you would normally have to deal with if you were actually doing this directly with Kubernetes and directly with this framework called Seldon Core that is basically the back end, the backbone that is doing all of this machine learning orchestration. So that's basically the key context of how we were able to go from that Jupyter Notebook environment into a fully fledged scalable service without actually uh, uh, losing the, 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 the capabilities of providing data scientists with the full power of doing local testing, ensuring that everything works as they expect, ensuring they're able to add any extra, you know, whether it is logging or metrics or, or, or custom uh, 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 insights that, that can be introduced so that whenever it's passed into the, into the sort of like production stage, it would actually be fully tested with even, you know, those relevant local uh, 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 tests that may be more relevant for unit tests. So with that said, today what we have been able to do, we were able to fetch a GPT-2 model. We were able to optimize it using the Onyx framework. We were able to productionize it using Tempo, first testing it in our local environment and then productionizing it in the Kubernetes scalable environment. Now, the key thing to mention is that, you know, Seldon Core is an orchestrator, so it would still use the underlying model servers like Triton, but you also support other servers like you know TF Serving, Torch Serve, et cetera, et cetera. So that's one of the benefits of leveraging some of these different toolings and different personas would interact at this in different sort of like uh, levels of abstraction. So with that said, to wrap up today, we were able to cover um, some of the data science, science challenges in MLOps. Uh, we were able to cover a hands-on example and use case productionizing a GPT-2 model. We were able to do this using the Tempo uh, library to test it in, in, in Docker and in Kubernetes. And then we were able to talk about some best practices and next steps uh, uh, that you can uh, take for yourself. Uh, as mentioned, you can find all of the uh, you know, links for this uh, presentation in this uh, link, uh, as well as all of the references to the notebooks both in the Tempo side as well as in Selvan Core. And with that, uh, thank you everybody for joining me today. 
uh, on this talk, Bridging the Data Science Gap in Production Machine Learning with Temple. Uh, thank you all. I hope you enjoyed the talk and I hope you enjoyed the conference. So now I'll just pause there to see if there are any questions. Feel free to put them in the chat. Thank you all. Yes. Thank you, Ali and Drew. So, we are, so uh, if you have any questions to our speaker, so you can uh, raise your hand or you can uh, put your question on the chat. So, so we can check it out. Um, for for the participants who ask uh, a questions, he or she will uh, have an opportunity to uh, get a prize from the uh, one of our sponsor PCCW HKT. So it will be a uh, one month pass, one one month pass of a uh, loud e subscriptions on uh on some channel <laughs> so some question is coming up <laughs> from matthew and ben yeah so uh so the first question from matthew yeah can i use temple with uh python trace instead of ons um yeah so so matthew uh thank you for your question uh the answer is yes you can actually use PyTorch directly or you can use TensorFlow directly without using Onyx. Um, primarily because the servers that Tempo and Seldon Core support uh, actually have support for PyTorch. And this is specifically the NVIDIA Triton server, uh, which supports Torch Sir. Mm -hmm. And the second question is from Ben. Uh, does Temple support to create West API in order to access the petition? Um, yeah, uh, thank you, Ben. That's a very good question. So the answer is yes. Uh, even though the Temple interface is Pythonic, uh, and what I mean is that you saw that we actually just sent a request directly using the Python function, um, the actual service that is running is a REST, gRPC, and Kafka supported uh, service. So both when it's running on Docker and when it's running on Kubernetes, it actually exposes, a, a, you know, as, a, as I just mentioned, like REST, gRPC, and, uh, and Kafka endpoints, which means that you can actually just send requests directly with curl or with gRP curl or with uh, Python's request library. So uh, the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, friends, uh, so we still have uh, two more two minutes left. So we can have a uh, one or two uh, quick questions. Yeah. So another question, uh, have you compared the performance with tools like Keeper? Is there any caching and the endpoint or even a feedback mechanism to improve the model on the go? Yeah, that, that, is a, that is a great question. That is a great question. So the answer is um, we do have uh, mechanisms to uh, highly optimize the performance. And the reason why we actually are using NVIDIA Triton server is because it's highly performant. So to give you an example, we actually ran some tests um, recently using NVIDIA Triton on a local laptop with a GPU. Uh, and we were able to achieve with MNIST, uh, 
uh, about 200,000 requests per second, right? Which is absolutely crazy. So um, the performance of uh, the underlying um, serving uh, options that you have with Tempo and Seldon Core are extremely, extremely, not just optimized, but also optimizable. Uh, and Triton actually provides you with a perf analyzer, which allows you to identify what is the best performing configurations. On top of that, you even are able to leverage the Kubernetes-based horizontal scaling, which means that you can have multiple different sort of you know, horizontally scalable uh, components that you can then you know, increase even further the performance. Of course, you know, there's some network costs, but uh, it is highly optimized and very widely maintained. So the answer is yes. So, and the last question is, uh, any there is low, let me try, okay. Yeah, the, the last question is, uh, any there is lowly to create any Docker file in order to build the Docker image? Yeah, that's a really good question, Ben. So, um, interestingly enough, for the examples that we showed, you don't have to uh, rebuild the Docker image. We actually, uh, allow you to just have to export the artifact. And for the custom pipeline, we actually um, leverage Conda pack that allows you to just export the Python environment that then is loaded on the server. Having said that, we also have mechanisms that allow you to build the image once you actually want to uh, and are comfortable to just push that to production. So you don't have to rebuild the image for the experimentation. And you also have the option to rebuild the images as required. So this is one of the big advantages of the frameworks that we use. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for, for your presentations. So uh, we hope that we will see you again next year. <laughs> yeah, likewise, always a pleasure. Always a great conference. Thank you, Sammy. Yeah.